come with us as we prepare to enter an existing silver mine in the Silver Reef Mining District near the city of St. George, Utah. The tour you are about to see was produced by the volunteers of the Silver Reef Museum in the town of Leeds. The mines of Silver Reef were predominantly located on the White Reef and the Buckeye Reef, including Tecumseh Hill, which are all pointed out here as well as the location of the Silver Reef Museum. These reefs are located on the west side of the Virgin Anticline. And, as you can see, these rock layers are tilted upwards approximately 30 degrees from their original horizontal position. This is Springdale, Utah at the mouth of Zion Canyon. Although no silver was found here, the layer of rock containing the silver in our mine is named Springdale Sandstone. Its distinctive short cliffs are exposed above and all around this small town, as well as extending into Zion National Park as seen here. In the early 1870s, it was widely believed that finding silver in sandstone was impossible until profitable ore was shipped to Salt Lake City in 1875. That silver was found in the same layer of rock, Springdale Sandstone, which makes up the White and Buckeye Reefs. As we tour the mine, keep in mind that it was developed during the silver mining boom of the late 1870s and early 1880s, so most of what you'll see is from that era. You'll also see evidence of mining work that was done after that time. We're looking at the outside of the mine. Let's zoom in into the mine's main entrance. This is a model of all the mine's tunnels. From this perspective, some people think it looks like an ant farm. And here is a model of the mine that you can hold in your hand. We'll refer to this model a few times during the tour. When you visit the Silver Reef Museum, this model is on display. We begin our tour in the entry tunnel. It's fairly level here because this is where loaded ore cars on rails exited the mine. The height of many of the tunnels in this particular mine is about 8 feet, which is just high enough for the mules to not hit their heads. Notice this diagram here in the upper right. It represents a two-dimensional map, like a floor plan, of all the tunnels inside the mine. The red dot points out where we are located along the tour. You'll see the red dot move as we travel through the various tunnels and shafts inside the mine. Now you're going to hear a former mining engineer explain the details about this old silver mine. He has actually walked through all of these tunnels. We are now inside the mine. On the left we are passing a vertical shaft. This shaft connects to a declining tunnel that was dug to access lower levels of the mine which we will see later. This shaft provided access for materials, compressed air piping, and ventilation for that part of the mine. We are proceeding into the mine until we reach a major intersection called a crosscut tunnel. This type of tunnel is used to connect other sections of the mine. It is also where the entry tunnel has intersected the ore seam. From there, the miners followed the seam to the left and right. As we turn left, we are faced with a head frame, which is used to dump ore cars from the decline shaft that we are about to enter. The cars were one-tonners, pulled by mules, and were dumped into empty cars passing underneath the frame. Those ore cars were then pulled outside to a waiting wagon that would take the ore to a mill. Traveling down the decline shaft, following the ore seam, we noticed some rubble on the floor. Over the past 140 years or so, some rocks have fallen, but the tunnel is still remarkably stable. 
At this point, you can see that the miners have created a large room, known to the miners as a stope because the silver was more concentrated here. You can see how the room is supported by wooden posts. Eventually, when the rooms become too large or the posts supporting them weaken over time, the rooms cave in. Even though the decline shaft continues in front of us to below the valley floor, we will not venture past the safety of our tunnel. We turn around, back up the decline to the head frame. At the head frame, we turn left and proceed through the crosscut tunnel, still following the ore seam. We see rooms gouged from the sides of the crosscut tunnel, where isolated seams of ore were worth mining. We come to the end of the crosscut tunnel. To the right is a larger area that was mined, but only high enough to take out the ore. The miners stopped digging the crosscut tunnel here because the silver content in the ore was not high enough to justify mining it further. Turning around, we go back to the head frame where we will follow the crosscut to the right from our mine entrance. Almost immediately, a tunnel veers off to the left, separate from the crosscut tunnel. Following that tunnel, it leads to a vertical shaft above us. that accesses an upper level of the mine. As we back up out of this tunnel, notice the ore car rails on the floor. Back in the crosscut tunnel, we see pockets on both sides where miners also remove ore. We now approach a wooden chute that follows the ore seam up an incline. As we pass the chute, notice the ladderway alongside it that was used to access mining areas above the crosscut tunnel. Miners would mine areas where the ore seams were profitable and use gravity to send ore down the chute into a waiting ore car. This mining method was called stoping. It was always easier to mine ore this way, rather than needing to hoist the ore up to the ore cars. Continuing down the crosscut tunnel, we'll take a quick look back. Now we'll turn back around and proceed to the end of the crosscut. Here we'll turn left and look up an inclined shaft that follows the ore seam. At this spot we see darker seams in the sandstone. These seams are where the silver bearing ore is found. Actual silver content would be determined by sampling the ore zone and having the sample assayed. Samples were taken often to make sure the ore was worth mining. The seams were not consistent or continuous. In some locations they were much thicker. So as the seams came and went, so did the mines. As we turn around to exit, we pass a wooden sample collector that was used to funnel an ore sample into a bag. The miner would use a pick to chip a groove in the mine wall where mining was occurring, with the sample collector below collecting the chips. This sample would be taken to an assayer to determine the estimated value of the ore to be mined. As we approach the wooden chute again, Notice on the right how the broken rock was obviously been stacked to support the ladder way and stabilize the opening. Just before we reach the entry tunnel, you'll notice we are higher than the tunnel below. The rails from the crosscut stopped here and the ore was dumped into empty cars in the tunnel below waiting to be hauled outside. We leave the crosscut tunnel, turn left into the entry tunnel, and pass the head frame as we go back to the entrance. The tunnels here are holding up well, as is the case in many of the silver reef mines. The mines never reach great depths here because when they encountered the water table, the silver disappeared, so there was no reason 
to dig further. Now that we have exited the mine, we remind everyone that for public safety, the mines in Silver Reef Mining District have been closed by the Utah Division of Oil, Gas, and Mining. Many of the openings are closed with rebar gates so that native bat colonies can still use them. Open underground mines present many potential risks, including unstable ground and unknown air quality. Please respect mine closures, stay out of abandoned mines, and stay safe. We hope you enjoyed the tour of this old silver mine. Since you took the tour virtually, just think of all the dust you don't need to wipe off yourself. Or feel the uneasiness or anxiety of wandering around these tunnels and being concerned about a cave-in, breathing in poisonous gases, all while being in extreme darkness. If you enjoyed this type of informational video tour and would like to see more of them, please help us by contacting us through our website at silverreef.org. Go to the contact page and let us know how you'd like to help. You can contact us directly using this phone number or email address. Thanks again for coming along with us and we'll see you on the next tour.